In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Not that long ago, but in a place far away, a very powerful executive went to the window of her penthouse office in New York City and surveyed her kingdom. News was brought to her that one of the managers of the Southern franchise was squandering her possessions. Not only that, but he was planning a coup to overthrow. So she picked up the telephone and called and said, What is this that I hear of you? Give me an account of your stewardship. And the manager said, What am I going to do? I'm too weak to dig and too poor to beg. I know what I'll do. And quickly he called all of those who were under his authority and he said, Quick, take these quit claim deeds from me. And all that is mine will be yours. Not all, but many, if not most, said, What a great idea. What about our pensions? Oh, that's the good thing. We won't be ruled by the CEO up in Yankee land anymore, so we can get our full pensions and continue to work for our full salaries. And they said, Oh, that sounds good to me. When the presiding, I mean, the CEO (laughs) heard this news, she was delighted and she commended the dishonest servant for his shrewdness. Now that part didn't happen. (laughs) But does any of that make any sense at all? Is there a universe or a parallel universe where the point that Jesus is making in this parable begins to make any sense to anybody? I want you to know, this guy was supposed to be preaching this parable this morning. (laughs) And because I switched off to do my niece's wedding, the lot fell to me. This is one of those difficult parables. Martin Luther who was no fundamentalist, remember he wanted to leave Revelation out of the Bible because it wasn't revealing and he hated the epistle to James, an epistle of straw he called it. He said sometimes the text is so hard that you have to squeeze it just to get it to leak a little bit of gospel. So that's what we have here is one of those hard sayings of Jesus. Some people look at it and say, Did Jesus even say this? It sounds inconsistent with what we know about Jesus. Praising dishonesty. It doesn't seem to make sense. But the only witness that we have, only one, is that Jesus did say it. One of my commentators that I looked to this week said, he can imagine Luke with his stack of index cards. You know, he's got all the sayings and the things that had come down to him from oral tradition. He takes the rubber band off and he said, now I've just finished the prodigal son. Where will this bit fit in here? It's really not a time in the life of Jesus to be going back to moralizing sayings. You know, the time for that was 10 chapters ago uh, on the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus was interested in helping the disciples learn how to pray and how to live an ethical life. But right now, towards the end of his ministry, he is about to go into Jerusalem. He's about to face the cross there. And so his emphasis is now radically focused on helping people to see that resurrection comes out of death. The other thing to remember, and this is hard for us sometimes, is that the parables are never intended as blueprints for how to live our lives, nor are they blueprints for how to run a parish. They are parables of the kingdom. They are to teach us how God loves us, the sacrificial love with which he loves us, and what he's willing to risk for us. I mean, just take last week for an example. Um, What man having a hundred sheep would not leave the ninety and nine and go after the one? Is that a good way to run a business? 
leave 99% of your assets unprotected to chase after the one? No. It's not even a particularly good way to run a congregation, is it? But it makes perfect sense within the context of the kingdom of God. I would suggest to you that none of the ways that we would try to interpret this parable can make any sense at all. Is this man, this dishonest steward, um, is he a good man in any way? Why is he then praised? It doesn't seem to make any sense. Is Jesus saying that the bottom line is the only thing that matters? It doesn't matter how you get there. Nothing else in the teaching ministry of Jesus would suggest such a thing. And so scratch our heads as we might, squeeze as we might, hoping for some gospel to leak out as we might. The only conclusion that I can come up with, the only thing that makes any sense at all, and you're going to scratch your heads at this, is that Jesus intends us to see him, Jesus, as the unjust steward. Still not making any sense to you? Far-fetched? Well, my old friend, Father Robert Capon, has this to say. This parable, therefore, says in story form what Jesus himself said in his life. He was not respectable. He broke the Sabbath. He consorted with crooks. And he died a criminal. Now, at last, in the light of this parable, we see why he refused to be respectable. He did it to catch a world that respectability could only terrify and condemn. He became sin for us sinners, weak for us weaklings, lost for us losers, and dead for us dead. St. Augustine said, the cross is the devil's mousetrap, baited with Jesus' disreputable death, and it is a mousetrap for us too. Jesus baits us criminals with his own criminality as the shabby debtors in the parable were willing to deal only with the crooked steward and not with the upright Lord. So we find ourselves drawn by the bit of bait of a Jesus who winks at iniquities and makes friends with sinners. Of us crooks, that is, and of all the losers who would never in a million years go near a God who knew what was expected of himself and insisted on what was expected of others. You don't like it? You don't like that interpretation? You think it lowers the standards and threatens good order? Well, you bet it does. And if you will cast your mind back, you will recall that is exactly why the forces of righteousness got rid of Jesus. Unfortunately, though, the church has never been able for very long to leave Jesus looking like the unattractively crummy character he is. It can hardly resist the temptation to gussy him up into a respectable citizen. Even more unfortunately, it can almost never resist the temptation to gussy itself up into a bunch of supposedly perfect peaches, too good for the riffraff to sink their teeth in. But for all that, Jesus remains the only peach, too fuzzy on the outside, Nowhere near as sweet as we expected on the inside. And with that jaw-breaking stone of his death, right smack in the middle. And therefore, he is the only mediator and advocate the likes of us will ever be able to trust. Because just like the unjust steward, he is no less a loser than we are. And like the steward, he is the only one who has even a chance of getting the Lord God to give us a kind word. And the Lord praised the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. For the children of this world are shrewder in their generation than the children of light. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And his own people did not receive him. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and finding himself merely human, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God himself exalted him and graced him with a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father. 
Lucky for us, we don't serve a just steward. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.